So Goldstein Peep House give us this idea of conflict in the international system being about either identity or about interests. And if conflict is about interests, then I think it's worth thinking about whether or not um, those conflicts over stuff or, or interests uh, really pass a, a cost benefit test, or I guess another way to say it, is war rational? And at first that might seem a little strange, but all we're really saying is, is does war make sense in terms of a cost benefit calculation? And is that cost benefit calculation uh, better than some of the alternatives? And so at first glance, when we start tallying up the benefits, the things that states are fighting over, whether it's territory or economic issues, there's certainly a lot of value there, but the costs are massive. Uh, the cost in terms of you know the destruction of life and property, um, the cost of, of financing war, military force in the modern era is incredibly expensive. You know, a million dollars plus for a cruise missile, a um, million dollars plus for the United States to put a soldier in Afghanistan for a year, um, and even the Iraq War, which was a relatively minor invasion or, or war by you know historical and global standards, still cost the United States at least a couple trillion dollars, um, not to mention the thousands of lives lost on the US side and the hundreds of thousands of lives lost on the Iraqi side. So we're talking about these, these incredibly high costs. And when you think about war, not just as a cost benefit calculation, but what are the alternatives? Oftentimes negotiation is a much better strategy because you get something for far less cost. And so that's, that's really the puzzle uh, at the heart of this idea about war being rational. And yet political scientists have kind of worked with this idea and developed what is called the bargaining theory of war. And the, the basic idea behind the bargaining theory of war is that there's something that you're fighting over, a, a, an issue or a, a pie of value, a share of value, and states have to figure out how to divide up that pool of value. Um, and, and split it between them, and they have to agree on the division. I get half, you get half, that seems like a reasonable um, solution, but if I'm much more powerful than you, I might say I should get three quarters of that pie and you should only get a quarter, and you might ask why, and I would say, well, because I'm, I'm bigger and stronger, and if it comes to blows and we fight, I'm gonna win, so I should get more. And from that perspective, war occurs when states disagree about what would happen if they got into a fight. And so if I think I'm gonna win that fight and you think you're gonna win that fight, we might discover, um, we might disagree, we might not be able to come to a conclusion, and then we fight to learn who was right and who was wrong. And so from the bargaining theory of war perspective, um, war is about sort of clarifying that uncertainty about what would happen if there was war so that states can return to the bargaining table and more efficiently reach a solution that reflects the distribution of power between them. And yet, that still raises kind of a puzzle for me because war is so costly, right? so destructive, that even if I think I'm entitled to three quarters of the pie and you're only entitled to a quarter, the cost of war probably makes me willing to go with you know two thirds or 55% because I don't wanna pay those costs of having to demonstrate that I would actually win that conflict. There should be a lot of bargaining space where states can still work together and, and find a negotiated settlement. And yet there are some situations where that really breaks down and where we think war might end up being a rational calculation even if everybody is fully informed about what would be the consequences of, of war. And so one scenario where we think war might be rational, where you do the calculation, say, negotiating just isn't going to work. It might look better on, you know, on the surface, but in the long run, I'm, I'm better off choosing warfare. One of those situations would be where the thing that you're, you're negotiating over, the thing that you're dividing up is indivisible. There, there's no way at all to, to share it out and to, um, to, to negotiate over it. And so if I was trying to come up with an example of, of an ex, you know, where we might see indivisibility, I might point to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is you know, complex, but one of the pieces going on is that there's a question about the division of land, right? So what territory should go to Palestinians and what territory should remain part of Israel? And that's a fairly easy thing to solve. We solve that problem all the time by drawing lines on maps, but it's not just about land. It's also about the status of Jerusalem. Um, which both Israel and the Palestinian Authority claim as the capital um, for their, their states, um, for their, their political entities. 
And the question is, how do you share that city? And can you share that city? And the answer is probably, yeah, the cities get shared all the time and you can divide up East Jerusalem from West Jerusalem. That's possible. But then there's the question of the Temple Mount and the Dome of the Rock, which sits right on top of the Temple Mount. So one of the holiest sites in Islam and the holiest site in Judaism share one physical point in space. And there's really no way to cut that in half so that it can be shared out. One side is going to control that spot and the other side isn't. And so there are occasionally situations where we can say, I'm fighting over this thing because there is no physical way to share it. Um, it, it it's an all or nothing kind of thing. And in that situation, maybe it would make sense to roll the dice and, and try war as destructive as it is because it's either that or nothing. Um, another situation where we think maybe war is rational is what we would call the commitment problem. Um, and that's where we could negotiate a deal today and it would work and we can divide up this pie and we can, we can share out these resources and that would be fine. We'd both be satisfied today, but the future is uncertain. And I'm looking f into that un uncertain future and I'm seeing the balance of power shifting between us and maybe I see you gaining advantage in the future and my losing advantage in the future. And I might say to you, um, you know, this deal that we're going to work out, it it's going to hold for all time, correct? And you would say, oh yes, of course. And yet you can't really promise in any sort of credible way that I'm going to believe that six months, a year, 10 years down the road, when you're much more powerful than I am, you're not gonna come back and say, hey, let's renegotiate that deal. Maybe it would be better for me to actually fight now when fighting actually favors me to try to get something that, that feels a little bit more permanent rather than risking um, that in 10 years when, when things have turned against me, um, you'll come back and, and we'll work this out. And I think one place where we see this, um, and, or maybe an example of this, is in the, the Eastern Front in World War II. Um, coming out of World War I, Germany had fought a, a two-front war and Hitler understood that that was sort of a mistake strategically on Germany's part and, you know, wanted very much to avoid a, a two-front war as he sort of sought to conquer all of Europe. And so one of the first things that he did is he cut a deal with um, the Soviet Union to divide up Eastern Europe. And that's essentially worked out a deal um, to avoid fighting a two-front war. And then mid-war, he goes back on that deal. And part of what probably explains that um, is that Hitler was thinking about the longer term. Um, he was thinking about how, in terms of population, in terms of industrial capacity, the Soviet Union was um, going, to, going to outstrip Germany fairly soon um, and uh, over the long term would be far more powerful than Germany. Um, and also that the Soviet Union was going through a, a series of military purges and so their officer corps had been absolutely decimated. And so Hitler was sort of doing the calculation of, I could wait until conditions favor me a little bit better or I could strike now or I, I could wait, and but conditions would not favor me as well as now. The Soviet Union will be stronger. I'm better off fighting now, even though we had just cut a deal, than I would be to wait and hope that the Soviet Union honors that deal in the future. So that's a commitment problem. That, that's also sort of a reason why states might choose to fight, even when they um, are doing sort of a rational calculation about costs and benefits and, and recognize the negotiation in the short term at least, looks like a better strategy. The final story that we tell about why states might opt to fight given the you know, utter you know, magnitude of, of costs that come with war is this idea of deterrence, that negotiating might actually encourage other sides to make demands. And so this is something we talk about when we talk about the spiral model versus the deterrence model, um, but it, it shows up here in, 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 our, in the bargaining theory of war. Um, that if you negotiate with others, they might t take that as a sign that you're willing to compromise and they might make demands that they hadn't previously made. And therefore, when you're choosing not to negotiate, when you're choosing not to um, cut a deal, the actual thing that you're fighting over right now might not matter. But it might be that when you take this particular issue and the next issue and the next issue and the next issue after, after that, that collectively all that adds up to something that's maybe worth fighting for. Um, and so the example I, I might give would be the uh, example of the Western Front in World War 
uh, too, where you know the, the conflict doesn't begin with Hitler sort of cackling maniacally and says, I'm going to conquer the world. The conflict begins with Hitler remilitarizing the Rhineland, which had been as part of um, the Treaty of Versailles, an agreement that this area would remain you know, free of, of military equipment, and Hitler moves military equipment back in, and Britain and France sort of look at that and say, well, we don't like it, but we're not going to oppose it. Um, the next step that Hitler takes is um, the Anschluss, the unification with Austria, um, again, where he's sort of testing to see what's going to be the reaction of Western powers. And again, they sort of say, well, yes, we said that you shouldn't be able to do that, but we're not going to press you on it. Uh, and then there was the, the uh, request to seize a chunk of territory from Czechoslovakia, and uh, Britain and others, you know, meet with Hitler in Munich, and Munich and, and Hitler says, "Yes, this is the very last issue. I'm not going to, you know, take any more. Once I get this chunk of Czechoslovakia, I'm satisfied." Uh, they cut a deal with Hitler. He takes that chunk of Czechoslovakia and then rolls into the rest, and then moves on Poland. At which point. Um, Britain and France say, if you attack Poland, that's that's it, that's war. And Hitler at this point has convinced himself that Britain and France won't challenge him, that they won't push back. And so he rolls into Poland and the Britain and France uh, declare war. And so the, the idea here with deterrence is that you're not necessarily fighting over whether it, you know, the militarization of the Rhineland is something that you care about and whether the costs versus benefits of that make sense. You're thinking about the Rhineland versus the Anschluss versus, you know, the Czechoslovakia versus Poland, and collectively all of that um, maybe does make sense to think about in terms of warfare. Um, and so another example I can give you of, of this um, from the Civil War literature, that we find that countries that are facing only one ethno-national group that's making a claim for independence or autonomy um, will pretty quickly negotiate with that group. Whereas countries like India that have multiple different ethno-national groups that are seeking to tear off territory or seeking autonomy, that India will fight much longer uh, against those groups, um, pushing into the decades. And we think part of that is that you could cut a deal with any one of those groups, but as soon as you cut that deal, other groups are going to press their demands. Um, and so it's, you're actually trying to deter all of that. We have a I guess a game theoretic kind of model that we use to think about this idea of deterrence. And it's the game of chicken. And I think folks should probably be familiar with this. Um, this is sort of the classic story of you have two um, people, cars driving toward each other um, at high speeds and the sort of test of wills. And each driver has to make a choice about whether they swerve or whether they go straight. And if they both swerve, you know, they kind of, nobody crashes and they both kind of get out and the audience sort of, you know, boos and they look a little chagrined and that's, you know, we'll count that as zero in our, um, our, I guess, utility um, scores for, for the value that you get from this. And so the first zero goes to player one, the second zero goes to player two. But if player one goes straight and player two swerves, player one gets to, you know, jump out of the car and scream, yeah. It was not a chicken and the, the player two that swerves has to you know hang their head in shame because they are the chicken and I guess shame versus bragging rights you know negative one versus one in our sort of utility game it could go the other way right the player one could swerve but if both players go straight um, they crash into each other and and presumably die which we're gonna count as negative ten in our utility scoring um, and so anybody looking at this would, and, and I really encourage folks not to find themselves in a situation where they're crashing into each other and going straight, that's a bad outcome. And certainly if you're thinking about whether you would, you know, if you're playing this game once, um, whether you want to go straight or whether you want to swerve, you probably want to swerve um, because going straight could potentially risk, you know, crashing, unless of course you knew the other place player was going to swerve and then you go straight. As a story about deterrence and as a story about, um, the rational explanations of war, you're not playing this game once. You're not sort of working that table and trying to figure out what's the best strategy, what was my opponent going to do. You're playing this game over and over and over. And the thinking is that if you develop a reputation for swerving, that your adversary is going to feel safer going straight, knowing that they're gonna get the one, that you'll take the negative one, and that because you swerve, they're not gonna to have to worry about crashing. And so the thinking is that maybe sometimes it makes sense to go straight and crash and have that conflict to keep an adversary from thinking that they can constantly make demands, they can constantly take advantage of you, they can constantly go straight knowing that you're gonna swerve. Um, and so again, the, the 
the value of war, uh, do I even want to say that? The logic of war? What bargaining theory of war suggests is that states might opt for war as a way of establishing reputations for being the kind of states that will occasionally use military force, that will occasionally wage war, so that others don't press them and don't make demands, and so they're less likely to be taken advantage of um, by other states that are trying to um, press their claims at your expense. Okay, I'm not sure that this is necessarily the most useful um, way to think about conflict, but we'll tie this into some of our conversations about the spiral model and about the bargaining model. And we'll also come back to some of this when we talk about conflicts of identity, which um, also interact or also engage with some of these same ideas about deterrence and the commitment problem and indivisibility.